When Snow White and the Seven Dwarves opened to universal acclaim in 1937, audiences raised only one concern about its success. Would it be too dark for children? Animated or not, the film contained several sequences of genuine terror, and a villain who felt real enough to reach right through the screen and grab you. The British Board of Film Censors even went so far as to give Snow White an A certificate, preventing children under 16 from seeing it without an adult. So worried were moms and dads that it took a royal declaration to ease their fears, with the announcement from Buckingham Palace that Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret had seen the film, loved it, and suffered no trauma from the experience. With this news, the certificate was changed and the question put to rest, with parents reassured that if Snow White was okay for actual princesses, it was safe for their kids too. After all, perhaps children are more resilient than we give them credit for. Fear is not a foreign emotion to them, but something they face every day, with each new encounter a mystery that must be assessed for potential dangers. Perhaps in creating a film that personified good and evil so clearly, Disney had found a way for kids to familiarize themselves with these emotions in a safe environment, one that they knew, during even its darkest moments, would still deliver a happily ever after. And so, the world readied itself for a new era of children's entertainment, confident that the good folks at the Disney studio knew how to approach darkness in a manner both healthy and digestible for viewers of all ages. Then came Pinocchio. Pinocchio has two claims to fame in the Disney canon. It's the studio's darkest feature, and it contains their most impressive animation. These are only my opinions, of course, but they're shared by a solid percentage of film historians. At least in terms of quantity, there's never been an animated feature so packed with breathtaking visuals as Pinocchio. The New York Daily News called it the most enchanting film ever brought to the screen, while Leonard Maltin later wrote, With Pinocchio, Disney had reached not only the height of his powers, but the apex of what many critics consider to be the realm of the animated cartoon. While Snow White's innovative designs still look stunning today, they're also fairly restrained by comparison, overwhelming our senses but not our focus. We get plenty of time with each new character, background, and sequence before the story moves on, with ample warning before any major shifts in style or tone. Pinocchio throws that restraint out the window, pouring so much money into every shot that our eyes can't possibly keep up, and we must simply lose ourselves to a tornado of artistic achievement. So, whereas Snow White pioneered special effects to animate a cup of realistic bubbling liquid, Pinocchio's effects allowed for an entire underwater escapade, with immersive use of filters, rippling waves, and rays of sunlight shimmering down from the ocean's surface. Snow White had a cottage full of handmade furniture, but Pinocchio has a woodcarver shop crammed with finely detailed trinkets, and dozens of cuckoo clocks and music boxes designed from actual working models. Snow White opens with a groundbreaking multiplane camera shot of the Queen's Castle, but Pinocchio multiplanes into an entire village, pulling in on a simple storybook illustration, then back out to reveal hundreds of cottages layered with perfect three-dimensionality, and real electric lights spliced into the cells to create twinkling stars. Elaborate shots like this one took the animators months to pull off, but at the film's premiere, the audience didn't give much in way of a reaction. On the other hand, this shot of a steamboat from later in the film features almost no actual animation, and was achieved through a simple distortion glass effect that simulated movement across the water. But the audience was so impressed that they burst into applause mid-screening. Seeing these reactions, Walt vowed he would never again invest so much of his time and effort into a picture when simple shortcuts would suffice. And sadly, he never did. The only other cell animated features that have come close to this level of detail were Fantasia and Bambi, both of which were already well into production by the time of Pinocchio's release. All three films were commercial failures, hurt by having their European box office cut off during World War II, but more so by their own ambition, with so much blood, sweat, and tears mixed in with the ink and paint that there was no possible way for them to recoup their losses. 
Only Dumbo, rushed out on the cheap between the larger productions, managed to turn a slim profit. But by 1943, the budget had run dry, and Disney would spend the rest of the decade slowly rebuilding funds by packaging together cartoon shorts in place of features. But those first five films stand as a golden age of animation that in my mind will never be equaled. While the studio would find other ways to evolve in years to come, animation itself would never see another creative phase like this one, with the best artists from across the globe flocking to Hyperion Avenue to be part of Disney's visionary masterpieces. It was a melting pot of imagination that soon boiled over, and the art form ceased to grow. At least in the way Walt had intended. He found himself losing interest in cartoons, passing off more and more responsibility to his staff, and would never again assume full creative leadership of an animated feature. But we'll talk about that more in later videos. For now, let's take a look at what made Pinocchio so special. Carlo Collodi's novel was an odd choice for a Disney adaptation. From its opening lines, it establishes itself as a direct subversion of the studio's usual fairy tale material. Once upon a time, there was. A king, my little readers will say at once. No, children, you're wrong. Once upon a time, there was a piece of wood. See, Collodi isn't concerned with lofty, faraway lands, but with mundane objects and everyday responsibilities. Nor is his protagonist a love-struck princess dreaming of a better tomorrow, but a nasty little boy in serious need of some hard life lessons. While he's not the worst literary character to be adapted into a Disney hero, he certainly gets the most generous promotion. Or at least one of the top three. While movie Pinocchio is a naive but well-meaning child who wants only to make his father happy, book Pinocchio taunts Geppetto from the moment he has a working mouth. He then kicks him and runs away, has him falsely arrested for child abuse, runs home to eat all his food, and, upon meeting a kindly cricket who offers him advice, smashes it to death with a hammer. Chimney crickets! He then refuses to absorb a single lesson the world has tried to teach him until eventually a pair of robbers stab him in the head and hang him from a tree until he dies. The end. Seriously. The last lines of the original story are a graphic description of our hero kicking and asphyxiating as the life slowly leaves his body. It was only after readers demanded more that Collodi resurrected Pinocchio and gave him the happy ending we now know. But even then it remains a hideous little fable. Disney's first step was to sand down the edges, starting with the boy himself. After several failed attempts to breathe life into the spindly wooden toy of Collodi's description, Walt threw out months of work and had his team start from scratch with a completely new design. Animator Milt Call had revamped the character by drawing him as a human child first, and then adding on puppet joints and appendages, and the result was so much more appealing that Disney hired a new voice actor and reworked the script around their now highly sympathetic hero. Not everyone loved the change, particularly Italian audiences, who felt it fundamentally misunderstood the point of the character. As Russell Merritt put it in his essay, Disney's Byzantine Lumber Number, Collodi's apologists note that in Disney's design, Pinocchio loses the original's bite, his casual cruelty, his endless capacity for self-pity, and his arrogance. In its place, Disney has substituted a familiar American type, the sweet, well-intentioned infant incapable of anger or malice. The prodigal son has been traded for the innocent abroad. Man can't please everybody. But generally, the move is regarded as one of the smartest in Disney's history, and catapulted Yun Call into the top ranks of Disney animators. Though, depending on whom you ask, a large part of the credit should also go to Bianca Majuli, the first woman hired to the story department, who was the only one who could read the book in its original Italian, and encouraged Walt from the beginning that Pinocchio needed a much gentler design, but saw not a hint of recognition once the change was made. Remember her name, by the way, that's not the last time she'll come up on this channel. Cricket's the name. Jiminy Cricket! The ill-fated Cricket also lost any recognizable insect features and instead saw his part expanded into the first narrator and first sidekick in the Disney canon. Aided by the crooning vocals and ad-libbed one-liners of Cliff Edwards, Jiminy Cricket would become one of Disney's proudest achievements, and a go-to studio mascot second only to Mickey Mouse. 
Part of this is due to his iconic performance of When You Wish Upon a Star, but it's likely he would have assumed this role even without the song given how much warmth and personality he injects into the film. He'd go on to host Fun and Fancy Free in 1947, along with numerous sing-along tapes and educational films whenever Disney found himself in need of an MC. I'd even argue that he's a better fit for the job than Mickey, as he's got that Kermit the Frog-style mix of affection and begrudging responsibility that makes him feel like the true ringleader of the Disney gang. Incidentally, this is exactly what Jim Henson had in mind when he opened the first Muppet movie with Kermit singing a ballad whose lyrics directly call back to those sung by Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> if we only had these two leads to carry the film, it would still be a great ride. But Pinocchio also features a terrific ensemble of supporting players. Geppetto is an underdiscussed milestone in the evolution of human characters, as he's the first to balance the realistic physicality that we saw in Snow White and her prince with the slapstick capabilities of squash and stretch characters like Goofy or the Seven Dwarves. Notice that he can move with increased speed and weightlessness as the scene demands, but still always remains believable as an elderly human male. With brittle posture, five fingers on each hand, and an underplayed naturalism to his line readings that elevates his comedy to a whole new level. Oh, Figaro. I forgot to open the window. Alright, here comes my hottest take of the video. You ready for it? Figaro is the best Disney cat. I mean, just look at this little guy, he's adorable. Don't you just want to snug his tiny little tummy? Watch his face as he tries to sleep while Geppetto keeps blabbering on. It's some of my favorite character work the studio's ever done. His BFF is Cleo, the sultry goldfish. The pair had initially been conceived as a Sylvester and Tweety style duo to allow for a few side gags, but like Pinocchio and Jiminy they were softened up along the way with Figaro de-aged into a harmless kitten, and Cleo a precocious flirt who wants nothing more than to embarrass him. Though somehow she's still not the perviest fish in this movie. No more privacy than a goldfish. The only other female character in the film is the Blue Fairy, whose screen time is minimal but whose presence is felt throughout. Realistic yet wondrous, stern yet forgiving, attractive but never undignified, she acts as the film's moral compass whenever Jiminy falls down on the job, and stands as the one unshakable force for good in a story that otherwise gives free reign to the villains. Oh, and, uh, we'll come back to the villains.